No, I wasn't on it. I know a lot of people who were, yeah. and they never struck me as <laughs> the types to raid the Capitol. <laughs> Welcome to the deep chat. That being said, Parler and the people that... Uh, well, and we can't separate those two, I don't think. These discussions are linked, even though, yeah, we could say this episode isn't about the storming of the Capitol and our thoughts on it. You can't say that Parler's deplatforming is unrelated. Oh, it totally is related. It, and, I, and I understand that aspect. I just wanted to comment on the people who did that real quick. I want to be careful not to lump them in with the people who were on Parler that were just more conservative types, because everybody I know that was on Parler was more conservative type, who were not extremists. What we're talking about really is Parler being used as a tool to foment dangerous behaviors, right? I'm honestly a little bit confused about bits and pieces of it because... Well, besides it being a complex issue and a First Amendment thing and all that, I guess the top line issue here is, yeah, that this was a censorship thing, that in order to preserve peace or public good or whatever it is, that this was taken down because it's hate speech and insurrection speech and that kind of stuff. I read a, a number of things about this, and basically the reason that the big tech companies took it down was there was content calling for violence or specifically targeting certain people for violence. And that that is the root of the argument for Apple, Amazon, and Google was that they're not moderating their content enough. On the surface, I tend to agree. Okay. If you can't abide by some form of general decency, then yes, there are consequences to that. It's the company's right to do this. Let's establish that as well. The companies have a right to ban anybody they want. There's no argument there. Well, let's put a pin in that, but, but go on. Well, maybe there is no argument. I mean, legally, I don't think there is an argument, and I, but I'm not a lawyer. We have violence being called for, it not being moderated properly, and the argument for AWS, Google, and Apple is that they're not doing enough to moderate it. That's pretty much the argument that I've read. I would say that sums it up succinctly. The argument, the main crux of the argument, is in whether or not it's fair in terms of the playing field. I've seen reports afterwards that said that the bulk of the planning wasn't done on Parler for the Capitol riots. It was done on Facebook. If that's the case, and this is the problem with the media and the problem with information, if there's hypocrisy to some degree, or an uneven playing field, it just feeds right into, you know, quite honestly, both the left and the right's argument that the system is rigged. Right? The right likes to argue the system's rigged sometimes, and the left likes to argue the system's rigged sometimes. Taking a, a focus on this one moment and saying, it sure seems like this is rigged against the small company that is an upstart that's doing well, that's competing, right? If you can make the assumption that a lot of planning was done on Facebook and a lot of planning, and even, even if some planning was done on Parler, but a lot was done on Facebook. Because again, that's, that's what I kept reading, that the majority of it was done on Facebook. Well, I think we've got to go a little deeper before we can address that question, because just saying planned on Facebook at face value, yes, this seems like an inequity here, but was it that people did direct messages on Facebook? And that was their communication, but Parler was very public. Because I think we both agree we don't want the phone company doing content moderation. Uh, so why, are, why am I not okay with it there, but I'm okay with it, or at least open to the discussion on the internet, is because it's public versus private. I'm a very strong advocate that people have rights to private channels um, you know, for personal communications. Well, that's like text messaging, right? Yeah. So, and Facebook provides a messaging service. I don't know why anyone would trust it to be confidential, but there's sort of an implicit like, oh, this is my message to you. It should be an assumption of privacy there. If that's the way in which people coordinated on Facebook, I think it's apples to oranges. Well, and I don't know, but I've seen some heinous shit in Facebook groups over the last 10 years. So where does the, the line between private and public go? You're saying text messaging or direct messaging what about group messaging? You invite someone to a group and now they're on the group message on 
something like WhatsApp. What about that? See, there's this weird, interesting, slippery slope, right? I can put up a blog and say any nonsense I want, and no one cares, nor should they, unless I have 10 million uniques a day, or maybe even more. And suddenly now I'm, you know, like the deplatforming of Alex Jones, you know? I could say all the same crazy things he says or more, uh, but if I'm unpopular, no one cares. So there, there is a line in which that group text message becomes so big it's public. I don't know what the number is, but... Exactly. Yeah. Let's say we created a group Facebook message. You know, you've got Facebook Messenger and you create a group. You can create a group and you can invite 100 people. So let's say we did that and we slowly invite people. Question, is that public or is it private? If someone joins, can they see the history? So my hate speech was okay when it was just you and me, but after the thousandth person joins, now I'm in trouble. Right. And 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 can they read the history? If they can read the history, is that yeah. qualify? Does that change it at all? The conversation does it change what it means to have hate speech, right? And to, and to allow yeah. for deplatforming. So the reason I ask that is because. In a, you could switch that to a Facebook group. What if there's two people in the Facebook group? Sure. And then it becomes four, then it becomes 100. Where, where does it become bad, right? Where do you have yeah. to start moderating it? And that's what I don't know about Parler. Was there 50 people in the group? Was there 20 where this horrible stuff happened? There's a paradox that you're helping me frame here that, you know, if it's between you and me, two people, no one would disagree that's a private communication. If it's between you, I, and 350 million other people, well, that's a public conversation. Also, adding a person cannot make it less private. Therefore, there must be a minimum number we have to pick. It has to be as silly as that, that the courts decide 99 is the difference between public and private. Because otherwise, it's mathematically nonsense. It's not only like a slippery slope, blurry line, but even making the line seems awkward. It is, right. Is it about the number of people or is it about the ease in which you can join it? What if it's a private Facebook group that you have to be invited to? And you have to click all these waivers and stuff too about the awful things we're going to show right. you. Right. It's a little bit like med school, I would guess, right? They're going to show you a bunch of awful stuff there you signed up for. <laughs> sure. But what, you know, what, where is that line? It seems to me what they're ratcheting down on is. Groups of people with common interests that revolve around things that are potentially violent. Whether or not that that group is public from the sense of anybody can join it or private in the sense that you have to be invited, but it is a, a group of people that is growing. And then that goes back to our question. What's the number that yeah. makes it bad? What if you and I, uh, like you said, what if just you and I have some horrible hate speech between us? I guarantee nobody's going to look at it and nobody's going to, um, we're not going to get banned from WhatsApp or Facebook, right? Yeah. Well, it's even blurry labeling the content. Like, what if it's dark humor between you and I? We're sending back jokes about women, you know, or like blonde jokes. Uh, in many circles, that's offensive content, but to other people, that's dark humor. I have um, some black friends who've sent me the worst black jokes or white jokes, and it comes from them. Which, you know, in theory, I guess, makes it okay because they sent it. But that's the blurred lines, right? What is, if they're okay with the joke. Sounds like you might be getting set up here. <laughs> no, they sent it to me on Signal. They sent it to me on Signal. <laughs> All right. That'll work. <laughs> um, but to your point, is it that that blurs the lines? Is, is, is it when someone is offended or is it when someone calls for violence? Right. Because I can guarantee yeah. you that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about two things. If you're in a public forum and you put something out there that is potentially offensive, you will get taken off Facebook, been banned for a short amount of time and they'll remove the post. Right. Mm -hmm. It's offensive. So there's there's a category for offensive. And then there's also a category for violent. Right. We all agree violent is worse. But let's set I, we have to separate those two, I, I think. There's the question of what are culturally, what are we going to censor and that kind of thing. But there's also systematically what's okay to do to companies or what level of standard do we have to demand of content moderation. So if the claim is Parler was not moder mon doing good enough content moderation, then how do we measure it and how do we audit that they are? What's the standard? Yeah. That hits on the main argument. It's uneven in terms of its application. What are the rules? 
What are the, the very specific rules so that everyone can adhere to them and nobody has an advantage? Here's a conspiracy theory for you. Twitter seeing the end of the period in which Trump could respond legislatively in an effort to wipe out their growing competitor parlor, suddenly cut off Trump, knowing that all the hate speech and things would have to move to another outlet uh, vis-a-vis that secondary player and that that would overwhelm them and their resources and not allow them to moderate. And this was corporate espionage. I lo- Again, I love conspiracy theories because there's always – you know, a good one is an element of truth to it. Like it's believable. This is 100% believable because, and I'll tell you why, because if I am a competitor, if I'm running a business, you're damn right. I'm going to think that way. Now, did they conspire to make it happen? I don't know, but I could see someone running a, a business. These aren't dumb people, you know, playing the chess game going, okay, if we do this, then we do that. There's a good chance our competitor is going to get nailed. You know, when this was first presented to me, I was listening to some like uh, InfoSec podcast or something like that. I, I couldn't find the original place. And I also haven't been able to find anyone else saying this. But when I first heard about Parler, not only as a company, but the fact that it was banned, which I learned all at once, it was described to me that uh, AWS had discovered security holes in their software that exposed customer data. And they said, hey, Parler, you guys have 72 hours to fix this uh, compromising breach that's harming your consumers or we're taking down your servers. I've not seen that anywhere else. That's a much simpler argument that I couldn't be against. Uh, I would absolutely have done the same thing if I was at AWS and in charge of it. Uh, But when you take it down because they fail to moderate the content, um, I don't know. I, I think that there needs to be more structure around who gets to make these choices. The idea that an internet service provider, which is approaching a utility, you know, uh, the, the power company and the water company should not be deciding who gets their services. And I think cloud providers are headed in a similar direction. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Uh, that there's this gray area there that hasn't been sorted out yet because we're constantly on the edge of new ideas and uh, new ways in which people consume information over the last 20 years. And we're hitting this point where I think this was an, an inflection point where people realized, holy cow, the internet and Twitter, and Facebook, etc., they are essentially um, utilities. They're so essential to running a campaign for president, to starting a business, any of that. AWS, Amazon, or AWS, Google, and Facebook and Twitter. Can you imagine trying to start a business without them if you're if you're consumer, business to consumer? Let me give you an analogy that I think will help people who don't know much about cloud computing and whatnot. The company I run today is very small. Like I, you know, we're basically six people all in. What we're able to do in terms of standing up websites and having databases in different environments and all this kind of stuff is on par with the company I worked at about 20 years ago that required about 120 people to do the same operations. Because even having a database, today I just click, 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 and I get one on Amazon. That might have taken two or three professionals to make sure it ran in the past. So... Uh, if I was denied cloud services, I could not even dream of running the company I run today. I would need 100 people. My company, which does satellite communications, we run thousands of satellite communications through our platform every month. You know, We talk to a satellite, we get data, we massage it, we move it to customers. Probably 5,000. I don't even know what the number is. It's a lot. And it's a lot of data. Guess how much it costs us on Amazon? About 10,000 or less a month. If we were to try to build out a data center or something to do everything that Amazon does for us, it would be millions of dollars. And that would be before we could even sell anything to a customer. Right. We started, our first bill was $900 a month years ago, and we've just increased, right? So you can start a a business doing satellite communications for a thousand bucks a month and be successful at it. In that sense, it is essential to starting almost any business, even just AWS. And you don't have to worry about that server building flooding or being broken into. Yep. Those aren't your concerns. It is approaching a utility, and that's where the rules have to be extremely clear. It's my understanding that 
There is a def- different definition for content providers and content publishers. For instance, Facebook scrapes your content. It's all stored in a database somewhere. They look at the content. It is not encrypted in their database. They can utilize it. Well, it could be encrypted, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm, yeah. If Facebook can utilize your data, same thing with Twitter. That's the deal. That changes, if I'm not mistaken, because the data is something they can view and they're using it, it's their job to moderate it. Here's a question for you. If you had 150 people on Signal mm-hmm. or 1,000 on one Signal group chat, let's establish this, Signal is fully in- end-to-end encrypted. With a Signal app, the data isn't retained on a server somewhere, or if it is, it's short-lived, and, and more importantly, it's encrypted. It is encrypted and signal the company cannot read it, cannot view it, cannot look at it or do anything with it. They have no idea what's in it. And let's set aside all the cybersecurity encryption questions and let's just say it's proven this is perfect trusted encryption. Make the arguments easy. If you have 500 people on a signal group chat and you start sending these messages around, signal is not responsible for that content. They cannot moderate it. It's impossible. What happens, because this is going to happen and I I thought about actually creating it (laughs) a social platform that is end-to-end encrypted where none of the data is decrypted in the cloud the company that allows for the content to move through it does not decrypt the data it is decrypted at the endpoints the app that it goes through or the website that it goes through the cloud that it goes through can never monetize that data if you take facebook and replicated that but fully encrypted end-to-end Now who's responsible? Because that's what's going to happen. It's all going to move to being end-to-end encrypted. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, The truth is we get a lot of value as consumers by sharing our data with third parties. If they can't see the things you're sharing or interested in, they can't make recommendations to you. And while I know a lot of people kind of roll their eyes about like, oh, you know, I looked at flowers and for the next three months after Valentine's Day, I kept seeing flowers. And yeah, there's goofy stuff that happens to you, but... On the whole, there are annoyances and there are positives, and it's easy to remember the misses and forget the hits. There is a value add for those recommenders and things like that. And there will be both. Despite the fact that there's a value add, we have just witnessed the push towards end-to-end encryption, and Signal is the first case. Signal is a not-for-profit. They do not generate income off of your data. Elon Musk tweeted it out. I've been on Signal forever, and I've seen at least 100 people join over the past month. That's not that many. (laughs) Well, that's just me. That's just people in my address book. Okay. Signal's blowing up. I think it's a fad, to be honest. Uh, I don't think so. I think we're witnessing uh, people's awareness of um, the use of data in our lives and how it is being used and our hungry for something that allows them to be a little bit more free. And I think awareness... The parlor thing has brought awareness to it. But why would it be now? Why wouldn't it have been when Snowden happened? People didn't know enough then. People are getting more educated. Snowden was a long time ago. Now, um, half the population's voice is not necessarily allowed to be heard. At least that's how they feel, right, with parlor. Hey, quick nitpick. Uh, I don't think it's true that half the people think they don't have a voice. I think it's a minority group that believes they are half the people that think they don't have a voice. Agreed. Agreed. I, I mean, yeah. um, I'm talking about like half the people on Parler or whatnot or, or more. They're they're just on there, they're, but they weren't calling for killing people or violence and taking that away from them makes them more aware of how important it is to have an outlet that is uh, free and encrypted and et cetera. And I think that that, I'm saying this is the beginning of a a long-term trend is that data privacy, privacy rights, end-to-end encryption, it's all going to become more important. We will get a social platform without a doubt that is end-to-end encrypted and maybe even some people will pay for it. I'll pay a dollar a month and I'll be on it. And that's how it'll generate its revenue. I mean, Signal... I mean, that must exist already. Somebody's got to have done that and it's just not popular. Well, there's not end-to-end encrypted, but there are platforms. I think it was Me Too or... There's a, there's a number of other platforms which people have migrated to. Minds.org is Minds. like this. Yeah. We talked about that. But it's not uh, end-to-end encrypted, right? It's not the same gotcha. Not the same thing. I've done a little bit of looking. There's a paper from MIT about this. I mean, I think the problem is going to be user acquisition because 
if it's one of these things where it's like you got to first generate your PGP key, like everybody's out. No, nah, you'll make like it easy. Only the nerds are going to. Yeah, of course, you'd maybe. make it easy. Uh, you'd have to. And it would have to be something that's pretty transparent. But what if the company builds this thing? It's glorious. Everybody, a lot of people use it. It's getting all the attention like Parler. And then someone takes a screen capture. They are able to join and they take a screen capture of bad stuff happening on it. Well, that's not content moderation. So at least by this current action, we can't uh, jump to that conclusion. I think that's too much of a leap. What do you mean it's not content moderation? You can't moderate it, right? Yeah, so that would be it would be wrong in that instance for the tech platforms to have taken a similar action if, Por- if Parler had been end-to-end encrypted. That's my point. And that's why this is going to happen. Someone will do this, and it's going to s- put up another legal challenge because I guarantee you... Pictures will get leaked out about what people are talking about and Amazon and uh, Facebook, et cetera. Well, not Facebook, of but course. Amazon in this case will get pressured. Hey, this is of happening. Course, yeah. but, it, but then Amazon has to say, well, but it's end-to-end encrypted. And I, we, we don't, we can't view that content, but this is a legit picture from, well, yeah. where do you go? That's a tough question. I don't know. Well, I am strongly and very in a fundamental way one of the things that is truest of true to me is a right to encryption and for people who choose to to use it you can't ban mathematics and that's what it is so people have the right to use encryption i'm not willing to take that away in which case amazon has exactly a point we can't even see it to moderate it so it isn't our problem at that stage now going back though to what you said about uh, secure endpoints and things Amazon picked on them because I guarantee you there are a shit ton of other applications and things running on Amazon that have poor security. Or poor content moderation. Well, that's to the issue of fairness that you brought up. The other factor we didn't really talk about is effectiveness. You know, they don't need to pick off these tiny things with a couple of like teenagers goofing off on them. They need to identify the ones that are actual threats. And it seems they judge that Parler was such a threat. Well, I thought they were such a threat from, uh, well, not a threat, but that the content moderation wasn't good enough and they were citing, you know, these calls to violence. I did not hear about what you mentioned earlier, which was the, you know, secure, uh, the endpoints weren't secure, et cetera. And that that was a threat to, I guess, Amazon or other people's content being abused. So I wasn't able to verify that. Let's call that hearsay. Okay. But, you know, just to speculate about it. Uh, if there's some insecurity in their software that exposes the consumer's details, like if you're on it and you're a subscriber, I could see your credit card number, um, then that's actually Amazon going above and beyond, in my opinion, to help uh, ensure the world at large is safe. That is a basic, that would describe a basic, you know, uh, penetration test that Parler should have been doing on its own that Amazon did for them for free. <laughs> um, but I think set that to the side. Let's assume security wasn't involved because I would agree with the deplatforming there. Let's say their security was perfect and this is purely about Amazon saying we don't like your content moderation. Um, Now that I've said it that way, it's not Amazon's place in my mind. Uh, Maybe there's a governmental reaction, but yeah, I'm not happy about it now that I've thought more about it. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I I think there are we would have to unpack the legal aspect of it. Are they legally obligated? And you and I don't know that. And that's where we get an expert to actually talk about it. Um, But, you know, on the surface, if they are, the law's got to change. That's ridiculous. Especially Amazon. It's very different. It's Yeah. Yeah. It's not like Trump and Twitter. That's very different. Right. Amazon is close. Amazon is the utility in this case. I wonder what percentage of the web runs on Amazon. It's huge. Oh, man. Uh, It's Amazon, Google, and Microsoft Netflix. at this point. I mean, Netflix runs yeah, on for Amazon. The clouds. Yeah, right. So it's it's massive, and to take that away from any business is uh, it's, it's just a death sentence. Oh, it's a death sentence. Yeah, yeah. it really is. You cannot compete. I mean, so, that would be like I want to open a bakery and no one will sell me flour. I could go grow my own wheat and mill my own flour, but that's literally what's just been done to Parlor. You know, the whole banning Trump thing from Twitter, they can do whatever they want because it's a company. It's a private company. They can choose that. I I don't know enough about what he said that incited that. Oh, I looked into this. So on their official statement, 
there are two primary points. One is that he said this ranty Twitter or Trump like thing about like this is wrong and we need to be patriots. And then, according to them, shortly thereafter, he t- tweets something about I will not be at the inauguration. And Twitter's interpretation is that it's natural to draw the inference that the first is an incitement of violence and the second is an in, uh, indication of a target. And for that reason, with like, you know, a couple of like bullets and footnotes to other stuff, that was the core of why they justified the ban. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I'm fine with that if as long as they're clear about it. But I still also think that they need to really have very clear guidelines about about this stuff. You know, this goes back. Yes, and they haven't been. Twitter's been very vague and weird about a lot of the banning stuff. Right, which it, it makes it very easy to fall into that trap as a tech company that someone could say, well, you're being hypocritical. You let this happen, but not that. Well, technically, Twitter's defense would be that they've been actually the opposite. They've been very – they should have kicked him off a long time ago by their actual standards. Right. Um, like, right. I don't know if you know this. You can get kicked off for doing something called dead naming which is referring to a trans person as the name they had before changing their name. Uh, simply that can get you banned on Twitter. Wow. So Trump ought to have been gone a long time ago. I think they, by from their point of view, by Twitter standards, uh, they gave him a lot of allowance as the president of the United States. Right, fair enough. But my point is that in order to avoid the hypocritical things or moments that people can latch onto and argue about, there needs to be extremely clear guidelines for each provider that are easily understandable and digestible by the general populace. Right? I think we can agree on that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to disagree or agree with the whole Trump thing. I don't really know. Again, I don't know enough. I hear what you said. I just, I don't know enough. I don't have an opinion there. But um, I'm okay with it. I was with trying it. to state facts, really. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily know if I have an opinion either. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm okay with it generally because, again, it's a private company. They can do whatever they want. I'm a little on the fence about that because one could argue it's a public forum at this point. There's nothing quite like Twitter, and it does have a silencing effect. That's true. Yeah, I could be persuaded into that argument. The same thing with Facebook uh, and, yeah. and banning from using Google, which you know Google does, Google AdWords, things like that. They're fairly fundamental to starting a business, too, but not at the level of Amazon, of AWS. True, yeah. Because that's how it feels. Because the majority of people on Parler were were just conservatives. They're not people calling for violence. Gotcha. When... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Breaking news. Hold on one second. 